The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 14466 in the name of Lewis MacDonald on offshore wind week 2018. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons down? I call on Lewis MacDonald to open the debate. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you very much. Like any designated week, offshore wind week offers an opportunity to recognise what has been achieved so far, to celebrate the vision of the pioneers and to set out ambitious targets for the future. I've been able to see at close hand the growth of this sector over the last 15 years. Scotland's oldest offshore wind farm is a cross-border project in the Solway Firth at Robin Rigg, and I was the minister who consented the Scottish part of that pro uh, project in 2003, one well known to my colleague Colin Smith. At much the same time, Aberdeen Renewable Energy Group launched the first blueprint for an offshore wind farm in Aberdeen Bay, a scheme which came to fruition this year with the installation of the world's largest wind turbines within sight of Aberdeen Beach. <clears throat> we should celebrate the vision and drive of all the early pioneers around our coasts from the Solway Firth to the Murray Firth, but I want to pay particular tribute both to the vision of AREG's early leaders and to the support they've continued to receive over the last 16 years from Aberdeen City Council and other local partners. Five founder members of AREG got together to celebrate recently. Ian Todd, David Roger, Jeremy Cresswell, John Black and Morag McCorkendale told the Press and Journal that their eventual success was down to dogged perseverance and sheer bloody mindedness. That's sometimes what it takes and AREG's vision of offshore wind as part of Aberdeen's long-term transition from North Sea oil to a low carbon economy was and still is something worth fighting for. We need to have the same vision and ambition today. Scotland now has a committed offshore wind capacity of 4.2 gigawatts up and running or under construction or consented and awaiting development. A further 1.2 gigawatts are in the consenting process. That is good, but it is only scratching the surface of Scotland's offshore wind potential. With a UK target of 30 gigawatts and a European Union target of 74 gigawatts by 2030, we should be looking to deliver a higher proportion of both those capacities than simply five or six gigawatts by the mid-2020s. Our targets for offshore wind should reflect our share of the potential resource relative to the rest of Britain and the rest of Europe, rather than settling for just a bit more than is already in the pipeline. 10 gigawatts of offshore wind in Scottish waters by 2030, Minister, uh, that would be a stretching but an achievable target. Of course, it cannot be all about wind. Intermittency is a real issue. Uh, new technologies for energy storage, demand management, and new interconnectors need to be part of the future picture as well. But offshore wind is a renewable technology which works at scale, which is innovating right now in Scottish waters, and which is steadily falling in price. It is already contributing to carbon reduction and it can help to reduce fuel poverty as well over time. <clears throat> the largest of uh, Vattenfall's wind turbines in Aberdeen Bay are the most productive in the world, yet their suction bucket jacket foundations meant that they were installed quickly and quietly this summer in a matter of only hours. Also in the northeast, Equinor's high wind development off Peterhead is pioneering floating wind, a technology capturing energy from places where other renewable technologies cannot go, or at least cannot yet go. Kincardine floating offshore wind farm off Stonehaven is already following suit and is planned to be the largest of its kind in the world. With innovative technologies and increasing scale go also falling costs. The strike price for offshore wind in 2017 was half what it had been in 2015. The sector is moving towards a subsidy free market, but Scotland will only retain and increase its market share if it continues to foster innovation and if further growth continues to enjoy support from government at every level. Crown Estate Scotland and Marine Scotland have been consulting on which areas of the seabed to lease for future offshore wind farms. This Scottish consultation has focused on deeper water suitable for floating wind turbines, whereas in England, by contrast, the Crown Estate is promoting development in both deep and shallow waters. While it is right to seek to promote the newest technologies, we must not lose out also on those which are already well established or closer to market. So I hope the Minister will urge Crown Estate Scotland to broaden its area of search to support innovation in fixed foundation offshore wind as well as floating wind 
and so enable Scotland to reach for more ambitious targets in the short and medium term. Of course. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. And as the member will know, I'm the convener of the RMT's parliamentary group. And whilst we obviously celebrate uh, offshore wind week, and I agree with the comments the member has made, I wonder if he would agree with this quote from the RMT, which says, it is scandalous that the development of this sustainable energy source is based on deeply regressive and exploitative immigration and employment practices. So I wonder if the member would comment on those practices. Lewis MacDonald. Uh, Elaine Smith is certainly right to say that there have been some examples of exactly what she describes, and those are not the way forward for this sector. And I would agree with her, and indeed with the RMT, that we need to ensure that the development of this sector uh, protects those who work in it as well as looking to reduce carbon emissions uh, and reduce price for consumers as well. But the economic benefits of renewable energy are already significant. There are 2,000 jobs in Scotland, there are 11,000 in Britain as a whole, and UK content of projects is forecast to rise from one third to one half of the value in offshore wind farms by 2020. Scotland can do even better though, and joining up the supply chains of all our offshore energy sectors would be a good place to start. Opito, for example, has been doing offshore safety training in the North Sea for many years, and their qualifications are recognised worldwide in the oil and gas sector. They are not yet, however, recognised in offshore wind. Mutual recognition between the two sectors would allow workers to move between them to the benefit both of employers and of those already working in the North Sea. 40 years of extracting hydrocarbons have also given Scotland a high concentration of offshore expertise, which can be applied directly by future generations in capturing energy from offshore wind. In subsea engineering and offshore project management, for example, Scotland is a world leader. The Oil and Gas Technology Centre in Aberdeen is also more widely an offshore energy innovation centre, funding research and development, which will be of direct or indirect benefit to offshore wind. And today, Claire Perry confirmed in the House of Commons that a sector deal for offshore wind is nearly concluded and will include commitments from operators to increase UK content. That is welcome. I hope Scottish ministers will press for coherence between any uh, sector deals that come forward for oil and gas and that for offshore wind to support cross-sectoral working and to support the companies and individuals who work in and between both sectors. We should be ambitious for growth in offshore wind, for more and properly paid jobs for offshore workers and seafarers, supply chain opportunities for Scottish ports and industries, cheaper power for our consumers, and environmental benefits for future generations. I believe if we are ambitious, that we know from our energy past that we can succeed and secure a sustainable energy future. Thank you. Thank you. Open debate. I call David Torrance, followed by Alexander Burnett. David Torrance, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd first like to congratulate Lewis MacDonald on securing this debate today on the important role of offshore wind and the contributions it has made to reducing our renewable energy targets, reducing our carbon footprint and strengthening our economy. As we are all well aware, Scotland has been a global leader in renewable energy for years. In 2017, Scotland secured more than 68.1% of its electricity from the renewable energy schemes. Our renewable energy industry grew 26% and we now produce 25% of the renewable energy used across the UK. And since Scotland's first commercial scale offshore wind farm, Robin Rigg, was opened in 2010, we have built up enough offshore wind energy capacity to power more than 1.6 million homes. That means that offshore wind energy now accounts for more than half of installed renewable generation capacity in Scotland. Since 2011, the number of community-owned renewable energy projects in Scotland has increased by 62% which means that 456 communities are now benefiting from local winds, solar, heat pump, biomass projects across the country. From a national level to local communities, Scotland has consistently shown its support for sustainable future and its strength in the renewable energy sector. By 2030, it is predicted that the UK's wind capacity will double and that a fifth to a third of this new energy will come from offshore wind power. Not only is this cheaper than many renewable alternatives, but offshore wind is also more reliable and efficient than onshore due to a constant and steady speed and pressure of wind at sea. According to a survey put out by Scottish Renewables in 2016, there were 16,000 full-time equivalent employees in the renewable energy sector in Scotland. 
Additionally, our energy sector has spent decades developing its expertise in creating infrastructure to ext extract oil from the North Sea. Groups like Briggs Marina and Environment Services, which have over 40 years' experience in marine energy generation from an environmental research to oil spill response, but with $210 billion to be invested in the European offshore wind sector between 2016 and 2025, we now have the moral obligation and the economic incentive to utilise this knowledge and technology to support the growing offshore wind energy sector. Over the years, my constituency has repeatedly shown its commitment to offshore energy. For example, we have a home to a 7 megawatt leave mouth demonstrated turbine, which is the world's largest open access offshore wind turbine dedicated to research and training. For example, Fife Energy Park gives companies early access to offshore energy markets in the North Sea and allows us to use, take advantage of the fact that nearly 25% of Europe's offshore wind resources passes over Scotland's seas. One of Energy Park's current occupants is Montalian Fabrication, a world leader in developing deep water substructures used for offshore wind projects. Not only is Bifab a global, globally essential contributor to the offshore supply chain, it's also key to creating highly skilled jobs necessary to attract young people to a region, increase wages in the most deprived areas, and create additional jobs as demand for local services rise. Scottish offshore wind manufacturers will have to be competitive in order to win contracts to ensure funding and projects jobs in the years to come. This will require increased investment in staff training and infrastructure to compete with European firms. In the near future, it will be important to follow the resulting contract terms of agreements deals like BIFAB with bid for Murray East project as it will set a precedent for all big offshore wind projects in the future. Sustained support for our new renewable sector is absolutely essential to the health of the Scottish economy and the offshore wind energy continues to be the most cost effective investment that will support our coastal communities. Additionally, this commitment will create a range of new opportunities for future energy developments. As power generation capacity grows, we will not only be able to meet Scotland's electricity needs, but should also start supporting technology that will allow us to decarbonise other areas of society. Strong offshore wind energy, energy infrastructure will allow us to further support research of organisations like Fife Hydrogen Office, who are working to develop hydrogen, hydrogen powered fuel cells that can capture energy generated by wind turbines at night and use the stored energy to power vehicles from cars to shipping freight to creating the first hydrogen district heating system. Our organisations like Fife Renewable Innovation Centre, which has been leading the way in attracting investment and creating jobs within the renewable energy sector. In closing, presiding officer, I simply ask that recognition of Offshore Wind Week, the Chamber reaffirm its commitment to the sector, ensure that we are prepared to meet increased manufacturing demand and to call on the UK Government to uphold its promise of long-term support for offshore wind to foster investor confidence and to remain our leading position in this field. Thank you. Alexander Burnett, followed by Claudia Beamish. Mr Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I also thank Lewis Macdonald for bringing this debate to Parliament in Offshore Wind Week, uh, and can I echo his recognition of AREG and all the good work that they have done over the many years. Uh, so it comes as no surprise that support is given by every party across the Chamber for this motion, considering the excellent contribution that the offshore wind industry has been making to Scotland. Scottish Renewables reported that Scotland is the continent's windiest country, and with Scotland taking in 25% of Europe's offshore wind resource, it is great to see business take advantage of our natural resources in an environmentally friendly way. Now, as a constituency MSP from the North East, uh, I've also had the pleasure to visit Vattenfall's European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre off the coast of Aberdeen, and anyone who has seen it will marvel at the impressive scale of this project. The turbines are so powerful that developers have said that a single rotation of its blades could power an average UK home for a day. And it's not the only success story we've been hearing about this year. Just last month, I submitted a motion congratulating King Cardin Offshore Wind Farm Limited on generating power from its first turbine, and what, I, what it believes will be the world's largest floating offshore wind farm. And I thank Lewis MacDonald for recognizing this achievement in, in his motion. Now, offshore wind has been a fantastic boost to the energy industry in Scotland, creating over 2,000 jobs, bringing 1.8 billion gross value to the United Kingdom, with this expected to rise to 2.9 billion by 2030. And the potential for supply chains to the offshore industry is huge. Now, with a floating offshore wind farm, such as Highwind, able to generate renewable energy 
in previously difficult locations. A recent report by the ORE Catapult noted that with the right support, we could see up to 17,000 jobs and an additional 33.6 billion added to the British economy. And this would be a fantastic boost to the Scottish economy and would only solidify Scotland's position as a global leader in offshore wind. Now, as a country, we must do all we can to move to clean energy, and offshore wind has been a great step towards achieving our goal. And the Scottish Conservatives are committed to maintaining this success and global leadership, particularly as offshore wind is playing a big part in helping decarbonise the energy supply across Scotland and the UK. And with the cost of offshore wind falling by nearly 30%, in the last four years, it is proving that it is a viable and sustainable part of our energy mix. And Scottish Renewables reported that the offshore wind industry has actually beaten the price target set by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy of £85 per megawatt hour by 2026. And the Murray East Offshore Wind Farm, due to be commissioned from after 2020, will mark the first time that renewable electricity has been generated at a price equivalent to conventional gas. So it is important that we continue to strive to meet Scotland's energy needs and climate change commitments. And the Scottish Conservatives are keen to see an evidence-based approach to the mix of renewables across Scotland and diversity, so we are not dependent on one kind of generation. Offshore wind has helped us move towards a better energy mix across the country. And I look forward to working with companies across Scotland in building their offshore wind farms and hope that we continue to see the industry thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Ms. Beamish, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And also thanks to my colleague, Lewis MacDonald, for bringing this debate to the Chamber and to Scottish Renewables for organising Offshore Wind Week. It is indeed fantastic to celebrate this industry. 15 years since planning permission was first granted uh, for an offshore wind farm uh, at Robin Rigg off the coast of my region of South Scotland. Uh, I recently visited Aberdeen and was fascinated to see the giant turbine blades resting in Aberdeen Harbour waiting to go out to sea. They were magnificent and to me are a grand symbol of progression and sustainability. The progress of the offshore wind sector since 2003 is indeed remarkable and a true Scottish success story as, renew as Scottish Renewables put it. It delivers one of the cheapest forms of electricity generation, which means a direct relationship between the cost of the generation and the en end bill for consumers. Uh, prices of, uh, per megawatt hour have, been, uh, have beaten Westminster targets, as we heard from uh, Alistair um, uh, Burnett, and vitally it is a boon to Scotland's coastal communities. It is these communities that can be most vulnerable to the effects of climate change and coastal erosion and whose economies uh, have been asked to transition um, first. And the expansion of the industry means those with marine and engineering skills experience can shift to um, highly skilled employment opportunities, uh, a growing network of supply chain jobs, and those associated socioeconomic opportunities can only strengthen these communities. However, it is somewhat disappointing that the Scottish Government's uh, Transition Training Fund, I understand from the RMT, has only enabled half those who've applied as applicants uh, in the shift from oil and gas to renewables um, to actually transfer to the training scheme successfully. So I hope the Minister might be able to um, comment on that in his closing remarks. However, let's be positive. And 2,000 people are currently employed in the sector and new technologies and innovations suggest that the number could well rise. And floating wind, for example, is a chance for Scotland to be a world leader if appropriately fostered. And as we've already heard, the chance for up to 17,000 jobs by 2050, according to the report by ORE Catapult. It is shifts like this from the more traditional finite energy in, in industry to the renewable sector that demonstrates the absolute necessity of a just transition commission. For as long as our economy is transitioning, there should be a commission. And I will continue to press for this to be set out in statute in the Climate Change Bill. Offshore wind will play a central role in Scotland's future, um, in industrial future. And that transition must be equitable for coastal communities and workers involved. It is a fantastic example of how political enthusiasm can drive an industry forward. It, it was the UK and, and Scottish Labour governments 
who demonstrated an early commitment to the offshore wind industry, the fruits of which can be seen today, and is a meeting point of environmental protection and economic development, a source of innovation that increases competition and lifts the economy, as well as bettering our chances against climate change. As this parliament takes any decision uh, to, towards our net zero economy, we should turn our minds to the offshore wind triumph and celebrate it. Scottish Labour is supportive of a publicly owned offshore uh, wind energy company to, regain, uh, to gain control of the energy supply and transition to a publicly owned decentralised um, energy system. It holds great potential to speed up deployment, capture jobs and value, and value for the Scottish public while reducing energy bills for consumers. Of Scotland's total offshore um, wind sector, I'd like to highlight that just 30% is owned by public ent entities, which is a good news story. However, these are not Scottish and UK entities. Uh, although it is a pity these opportunities are at the, at the present outside Scotland, it is an inspiration that such a significant percentage is public. And Scotland can be proud to hold the title of Europe's windiest country. And it is right that this abundant natural resource should be used for the public good. So I thank you for your time and uh, I look forward to the Minister's closing remarks. Thank you very much. Mark Ruskell, followed by Lee MacArthur. Mr Ruskell, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank Lewis MacDonald for bringing forward this motion? And of course, this chamber has debated uh, many motions over the years uh, about offshore wind. Mr MacDonald uh, reminds us of the private bill back in 2003 under the Labour Liberal Democratic government, uh, which of course enabled Robin Rigg to be planted in the Solway. Uh, but I also think he's right to pay tribute to the pioneers of the Aberdeen Renewable Energy Group, that gang of five who are such strong champions. I've met many of them myself at renewables conferences over the years. Such passion, such professionalism, they've really driven the confidence in offshore wind and we pay tribute to them tonight. Um, but the rate of commercial progress in these last few years has been simply breathtaking. We still have a quarter of Europe's wind resource, but the cost of harvesting it has dramatically fallen from around 150 pounds a megawatt in 2014 to just over 57 pounds last year. Absolutely smashing Westminster's target of 85 pounds eight years early. The moment when it was announced that the cost of offshore wind had fallen below that of gas was another tipping point in our energy transition and real testament to the innovation that's been developed across the supply chain. We are witnessing such blistering progress and the prospect of floating wind as another widespread commercial technology developed in Scotland is very exciting. Or catapults analysis of both the domestic generation potential from floating wind combined with the potential export market paints a very healthy picture for the economy in some of our most deprived coastal communities. And like David Torrance, I want to see Fife at the heart of the forthcoming sector deal on offshore wind because the skills and expertise are there in the communities. We've got great graduates coming through Fife College at Resyth with all the skills for operations and maintenance work. We've skilled engineers and workers with all the passion, professionalism and integrity needed to make companies like Bifab a success. But we also need the pipeline of projects to come through to kickstart the order books for Bifab and many other Fife businesses that depend on it. And the physical assets have to be fit for the work as well Scottish Enterprise need to help bring the yards up to standard, working with Bifab's owners to deliver the facilities it needs to be globally competitive. But the prize is great because if we can double the domestic content of UK offshore wind farms from a third to two thirds in the next decade, then we can realize nearly three billion pounds of gross value added for every single gigawatt that we install. And that's real jobs and livelihoods if we can capture just a fraction of that benefit for five communities. Now we need certainty and progress in that pipeline of projects in terms of both government support and critically planning. And I'll confess it really pained me to see the legal challenges laid against the outer first to fourth wind farms at such a critical point in our energy transition and fight against climate change. But at the same time, we can't wish away the pressures on protected seabirds and marine mammals. They're very real, and European laws are there to defend species that are on the brink of extinction. So we need to learn the lessons from these legal challenges, which were initially upheld on issues of process. Disclosing data and allowing the review of it early on 
by all bodies, including NGOs, in the planning process is important because our natural heritage is our shared treasure. So its state and health shouldn't be concealed under commercial sensitivity. We must enter into decisions with eyes fully open. And the need for this due process must also be reflected in whatever environmental governance arrangements we end up with after March. So, presiding officer, the future has arrived, offshore wind has arrived, but let's harness its tremendous power to transform with wisdom and care. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Can I join with others in thanking uh, Lewis MacDonald for bringing this debate and also recognise his long-standing interest uh, in and support for not just the offshore wind sector, but um, right across the, the energy uh, sphere. I think it's appropriate, as others have said, that um, in this offshore uh, wind week that we have this uh, debate to, again, I think, restate the, the support across this chamber uh, for the development of the sector. And as a number have uh, already observed, this is a real success story. It's a success story in terms of uh, meeting our ambitions, in terms of the environment and reducing uh, emissions. It's a, a success story in terms of our economy and developing jobs and wealth creation. It's also, uh, importantly, a success story in our efforts um, to combat the scourge of fuel poverty. Um, so, as I say, for all those reasons, it's absolutely appropriate that we should be taking this opportunity to celebrate that success, dating back to Robin uh, Reagan. I well recall uh, from my time in the Scottish Executive, uh, Lewis MacDonald's in involvement in that, which was also a process that I think, interestingly, was pushing back the boundaries of how we regulate uh, in this environment and in a cross-border um, uh, context uh, as well. Since then, we've seen um, success story after success story with Beatrice, with Vattenfall. But I think it would also be a mistake to assume that all of this was inevitable, that the effort that has gone in to achieve that success should not be undervalued um, just because of um, uh, the, 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 uh, the progress that we've seen uh, over that time. And I think it's right that we acknowledge some of the pioneers who've, uh, who've been behind that, but I think they would be the first to admit that um, the contribution that they uh, have made rested very heavily on those uh, that they had around them supporting their efforts uh, all along. Uh, the way. Um, so where do we go from here? I think it's absolutely right, as Lewis McDonald, uh, Lewis McDonald suggested, that we, uh, we, we make sure uh, that we build uh, on that success by being equally uh, ambitious uh, going forward. Um, we can, uh, I think, set those ambitious targets for ourselves based on uh, some of what we've seen in terms of the plummeting uh, costs and, 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 and the improving competitiveness, competitiveness of this uh, sector. The innovation that we're already seeing uh, moving uh, not just from the fixed bottom developments but from the floating developments where again through high wind uh, and, and others we're seeing Scotland uh, again leading the way uh, and playing to our strengths which is ultimately where any economic or industrial strategy is best founded. Our, our strengths in terms of our wind resource uh, as others have, uh, as have observed 25 percent of the offshore wind um, capability uh, across uh, Western Europe, the skills base that we already have, uh, the academic research uh, that has underpinned that, all of those I think suggest that the success we've seen in the, in the past is, is success we can, uh, we can aspire to replicate uh, going, uh, going forward. I, I, as we look ahead, maybe in the slightly nearer term, I'm conscious that tomorrow we're going to be dealing with stage three of the Crown Estate Bill. Uh, uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon, uh, Lewis MacDonald has already put a pitch in uh, for encouraging Crown Estate Scotland uh, to be slightly more um, uh, supportive in terms of the, the, uh, the environment and the role that they have to play in that future success of offshore wind. I would make a plea uh, for ensuring that in terms of community benefits uh, for both our island and our coastal communities, uh, the offshore sector, I think, will uh, have to, to demonstrate um, what it is able to contribute uh, in that respect uh, as well. But the aspirations of something subsidy-free, I think, also puts me in mind of the lunacy of having uh, marine renewables such as tidal and wave competing directly with offshore wind for future support. It's absolutely right 
that we continue to support our offshore wind sector into the next phase of its development. Uh, but I think we risk choking off at birth uh, technologies such as tidal and wave if we put them up in, in, in competition uh, with offshore uh, wind. So can, we, can I congratulate Lewis Macdonald again, uh, thank him for allowing this debate to take place and for enabling this parliament once again to underscore our collective uh, support for the future success of the offshore wind sector. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson, followed by Maurice Gold. Mr Gold will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me just start by declaring I'm a shareholder in Scottish and Southern Energy and in the Boindy Wind Farm Cooperative uh, Limited, which is uh, a wind farm very close to where I stay. And of course, this is uh, an excellent opportunity, thanks to uh, Lewis MacDonald, to celebrate uh, offshore uh, Wind Week uh, 2018 and the contribution it makes to our economy, the contribution it makes to employment in local communities and of course the contribution it makes to the climate change agenda. Uh, it was only a couple of years ago when the French Republic's President Francois Hollande uh, offered his plea to work together against climate change. The time has passed when humankind thought it could selfishly draw on exhaustible resources. We now know the world is not a commodity. Well, with Scotland, uh, as we've heard, being the windiest place in Europe, uh, we have something that shows no sign of being an exhaustible resource. And the development of offshore wind uh, has been a terrific contribution uh, to the climate change agenda, uh, as well as everything else. And of course, I have two particular things. Where I stay, I only have to go a few hundred metres uh, to the east, and at night I can look out over the Murray Firth and see the Beatrice uh, uh, wind turbines uh, that were put up as the first trials uh, in the area. But more significantly, the high wind uh, offshore development, the floating off Peterhead, which has been referred to by a number of members and referenced in the, uh, in, in, in the motion. That's truly uh, groundbreaking, water-breaking uh, technology, and it opens the door to deployment of that technology in shallow coastal areas around the world. Now, of course, offshore wind is not particularly new. I know next to the Orison Bridge between Denmark and Sweden, uh, there's been a wind farm there for quite a considerable period of time. But the high wind technology and the technologies we're seeing developed uh, off our coasts are much higher capacity, much higher outputs, uh, partly because of developments in China and the use of rare earths and new magnets to increase what can come from ahead. Now, I visited uh, a local firm in Peterhead uh, in the last couple of weeks called Survive Tech. They are one of many firms that are developing new technologies. In their case, they're developing an escape technology for people who are up at the top of one of these wind turbines. And flashover fires can happen in a matter of seconds. So they've developed a, a very rapid escape technology. And I wish them extremely well. And they, they certainly deserve to uh, uh, get uh, wide market acceptance. But they won't be alone in exploiting the opportunities that come uh, from having these sources of offshore wind uh, close to some of our communities. Now, of course, there's uh, service vessels will be going out to service them, and a number of the harbours in my constituency at Fraserburgh, at Peterhead, and indeed at Bucky look forward to opportunities uh, to service them. And I understand if you go to uh, Caithness that uh, WIC too uh, would look to get its share of the business. And we'll see how that develops because healthy competition between these, these harbours is not at all uh, a bad thing. Um, and of course, uh, the First Minister uh, was up and visited uh, uh, the High Wind Farm. Pilot project underlines the potential of Scotland's huge offshore wind resource. So right at the top of government is recognised how important this all is. I too uh, wish it well and repeat my thanks to Lewis MacDonald for providing the opportunity for congratulating everyone who's involved in this and more to the point, those who will be in future. Presiding Officer. Thank you. Call Maurice Golden, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I congratulate Lewis MacDonald on securing this member's debate slot. 
There is agreement across the Chamber that global warming and climate change are among the most pressing issues facing humanity. The recent IPCC report makes it clear that the duty to act is shared by all countries and for Scotland a key component of fulfilling that duty will be to bring our abundant renewables resources to bear. It is more important than ever that we support the development of renewables in Scotland and with Scotland estimated to have a quarter of the entire European potential, offshore wind must play a leading role. There is no better time to highlight that than this week, Offshore Wind Week, when we celebrate both the successes of offshore wind and renewables in general. It is not just the raw resource that counts in Scotland's favour, though. As part of the United Kingdom, we have access to the wider UK energy market with all the benefits that that brings for future investment and expansion. And expand we have. It was not long ago, just 15 years in fact, that planning permission was granted for the first offshore wind farm in the Solway Firth. As today's motion mentioned, since then the sector has grown rapidly with a number of projects coming online such as the High Wind uh, Scotland development of Peterhead and Vatten Falls European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre in Aberdeen Bay. Perhaps more impressive yet, the Concarden Offshore Floating Wind Farm off the coast of Stonehaven, which when completed, is expected to be the world's largest floating wind farm. These sort of mile milestones act as a clear sign of both ambition and level of success being realized in Scottish waters. This expansion has uh, been seen across renewables in general in Scotland with consistent support from both the Scottish and UK governments fueling a renewables revolution that has seen the proportion of electricity generated from renewables jump from 38% in 2014 to 68% last year, the highest level of any part of the UK. One way in which I feel we could utilize any excess electricity generated would be to construct an electric arc furnace for recycling steel, perhaps accessing the steel from the 471 oil and gas platforms and 10,000 kilometers of pipeline in the North Sea. We want to see Scotland maintain this edge and our world leading reputation. And I believe that in addition to a solid environmental case, there is equally a solid economic case underpinning offshore wind. Costs have halved in recent years, down from uh, a strike price of over £100 per megawatt hour to uh, just around about £57 per megawatt hour, making offshore increasingly attractive as both an investment and economically sustainable energy source. Now it is time to back the companies, the investors and the workers who will deliver the projects of tomorrow and the economic and environmental benefits that follow. A key component of that will be ensuring that we have ac ac adequate provisions uh, of the shallow and deep water sites needed. As we look to 2030 and beyond, we must keep our sights on the prize of establishing Scotland as not just the leading UK in the UK in offshore development, but in Europe and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Paul Wheelhouse to close the government. Minister, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank Lewis MacDonald, as others have done, for securing this motion and welcome the contributions today from members across the Chamber. It's not always we can stand in this Chamber and say we're all united on, in support of a particular um, issue or technology, and it's been nice to be able to welcome speeches from Alexander Burnett and Morris Golden for once. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's a great, 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 great opportunity today. Offshore Wind Week, hosted by Scottish Renewables and Renewable UK, does mark an important series of events in the offshore wind calendar each year and bringing with it the recognition this sector deserves. So I think it is only right that we've had this debate here today in the Chamber, and it's very positive indeed, as I say, that we've got unanimity of our views. But our commitment to offshore wind is outlined in Scotland's energy strategy, which was published last December, which sets out a vision for the future of energy in Scotland. That strategy, in short, sets two world-leading climate change targets for 2030, with the aim of meeting the equivalent of 50% of energy for Scotland's heat, transport, and electricity consumption to be supplied from renewable sources and a 30% increase in the productivity of energy use across the Scottish economy. 
And uh, indeed, the, the figure that Morris Golden identified of 68% has actually been upgraded. There's, there's, there's been more recent figures that confirmed at 69%. So we've, um, we've even higher, higher achievement there than, than had been uh, seen. But we're now setting even more ambitious targets, though, through the uh, climate change bill that uh, Rosanna Cunningham's laid in, in May, and targets that will ensure that by 2050, Scotland is carbon neutral. Renewable and low carbon solutions will, of course, remain one of our key priorities and we will continue to champion and explore Scotland's huge renewable energy uh, resource and its ability to meet our electricity needs and contribute to these significant targets. Last week, WWF reported that in October of this year, wind turbines, that's both onshore and offshore, generated the equivalent of 98% of Scotland's electricity demand, or enough to power nearly 5 million homes. And it won't take many to, to understand that we have more than uh, 2 million homes, but not 5 million. So we're doing very well there. And 27 of the 31 days, wind alone met more than 100% of our electricity needs as a country. So that's a very positive story. But these figures are testament to how reliable and consistent wind uh, energy technology can now be and show why offshore wind will play such a vital role in our future energy system, particularly if we can combine with storage, which I think was a point that was made early on by Lewis MacDonald. He will know, uh, as I'll touch upon, the, um, the project at High Wind Scotland has also got the charmingly Batwind project, which is combining battery technology with the uh, uh, turbines offshore at Peterhead. The UK is already leading the world in offshore wind, and I'd like to think Scotland's playing a really important role in that, uh, with over seven gigawatts currently in operational capacity. However, as members have said, there is still exciting growth potential for this sector in Scotland. In Scotland alone, we have granted planning permission for over four gigawatts of offshore wind. And indeed, um, David Torrance was referring to, to, to um, the work that BIFAB is doing. Uh, obviously, BIFAB will contribute to the Beatrice offshore wind site, which is currently under construction, a 588 megawatt scheme. Uh, 35, I understand, 35 of the 84 turbines are now installed. Uh, it's a tremendous success story, and that alone will power and, and provide enough power for 450,000 homes. So that shows the scale of potential that we're talking about. We are home to the world's first floating wind farm, the 30 megawatt Highland Scotland, Highland Scotland project, located off Peterhead. And I was pleased uh, to join the First Minister in attending its formal opening. And I know a number of other members were there as well at that event to show their support. And also the second uh, 50 megawatt Kincardine offshore wind site uh, to off the coast of Aberdeen is currently under construction. And I, I certainly uh, welcome the, the positive remarks from members across the chamber about that project and indeed Mr. Burnett's uh, motion as well uh, on that subject. These projects were made possible by the Scottish Government when we used our executive power in 2013 to introduce the Enhanced Scottish Rock Scheme. That's no longer available to us, but it has helped uh, to bring on, on uh, innovative projects to demonstrate the technology and we're now seeing exciting potential for floating offshore wind uh, in particular. In September, I joined the First Minister at the opening of Vattenfall's European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre. Uh, I remember seeing Lewis MacDonald there, so we had a good catch up about offshore wind there. And I would certainly add my praise to the work of AREG as well. And Morag McCorkendale is a force of nature and her team uh, have been uh, really, really important in that development of that project. Uh, that project, of course, as has been said, boasts two of the most powerful turbines in the world. And not only that, uh, the project has also demonstrated innovation in the construction installation process with the innovative bu suction bucket foundations at the site, uh, allowing the record uh, of two hours and 40 minutes for the installation of a foundation, which is a fantastic achievement. And we supported projects such as these because we recognise that continuous innovation and cost reduction in the sector will be key to maximising benefits for both Scotland and the wider UK economy. And that's why the Scottish Government has committed £2 million innovation grant funding for offshore wind this financial year, uh, split between the Carbon Trust, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult and the Energy Skills Partnership. And I was pleased uh, to also help uh, celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Offshore Wind Accelerator in London last week. A very positive uh, progress they have made and they've made huge strides forward in terms of the cost reductions for offshore wind that we've all referred to in terms of the Dimer trajectory. So I congratulate them for that. Presiding Officer Marine in Scotland are working closely with the Crown Estate Scotland to deliver a sectoral marine plan that will guide future leasing rounds for commercial scale offshore wind sites in Scottish waters. Uh, Lewis MacDonald, Liam MacArthur and others have referenced this work. Uh, we are trying to strike and to pick up Mark Ruskell's point about uh, conservation of, of seabirds. We are trying to make sure we bring forward a range of sites that cover both the possible shallow and, uh, and deep water sites that allow both fixed and floating offshore wind projects to come forward. We need to make sure we do that with respect for, for the environment and clearly we are taking feedback from uh, a number of developers about uh, sites they believe should be in the, in the sectoral marine plan but the aim is to bring forward something that can be accepted and we can obviously get some momentum behind the development of the offshore wind sector. Absolutely, with your permission. Lewis MacDonald. 
Thank you very much, Minister, and I'm pleased to hear what you, you're saying about bringing forward a balance of, of shallow and deep water. Will that involve a change in the areas of search when Crown Estate move on to the next phase, uh, 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 and is that going to enable the uh, mix that you've described? Minister. Well, well clearly, I, I can't prejudge what the, the, the final version will, will actually produce, but we're clearly listening to uh, those who are promoting different sites, and we obviously have to take on board the considerations that Mark Ruskell has outlined in terms of consideration of impact on uh, ecology and particularly seabird populations. I would argue though that uh, climate change is probably the single biggest threat that these species face and therefore we have a duty to try to address that but I'm aware that there obviously are concerns about uh, the diversion of, of, of seabirds from, uh, from their feeding routes. Um, but clearly we will uh, hope to feed back. And uh, what I would say to Lewis MacDonald and others is that Crown Estate Scotland and Marine Scotland are very much working together on this and, and, and information sharing uh, as, as they go along. But th this process is why we continue to engage with the UK government to ensure that the UK's uh, supply chain, obviously Scottish supply chain and devolved powers to support the sector are reflected in the offshore wind deal proposal. I met Baroness Brown last week, who's leading on the sector deal, and also met Minister of State Claire Perry for a positive meeting actually to discuss a number of issues, but also floating wind and, and, and uh, fixed bottom wind were very much areas that Ms Perry uh, stressed uh, her support for. And, uh, but clearly, as others have indicated, we need to see uh, the support mechanism such as CFD reflect the additional costs that currently floating wind are facing. And we would certainly argue um, that would be a positive opportunity when we see companies like Equinor, who obviously developed the High Wind Scotland site, uh, now taking forward a, an innovative project in Norwegian waters in the oil and gas sector to provide uh, called Project Tampen, which is going to put uh, 11 turbines, offshore floating turbines, uh, between two uh, oil and gas fields and significantly decarbonise production of oil and gas uh, by doing that. So that's a good example of how sectors can actually work together. And uh, we certainly are encouraging both the uh, offshore uh, uh, wind se uh, sector deal team and the oil and gas sector te deal team to work together as best they can. And I met Trevor Garlick this morning on that very subject. But our transition to a low carbon economy represents one of the Scotland's most significant opportunities for economic and industrial development. As others have said, as Stuart Stevenson referenced this, um, WIC is benefiting significantly from the Beatrice offshore wind site. Uh, I'm pleased to say that Fraserburgh, hopefully, will uh, now having been selected as the O&M base for the Murray East site, will benefit significantly for that, from that project. And uh, I was delighted to also hear today announcement of a £10 million deal between the Murray East offshore wind farm and the port of Cromarty Firth that will see a number of storage facilities provided by the port over an 18 month uh, contract. And this deal is not only a significant milestone in the delivery of the project itself, but the use of the port as a hub during construction will attract high value jobs and investment to the local area, which I very much welcome. And I look forward to seeing the progression of both this partnership and the O&M uh, contract operation and maintenance contract awarded to Fraserburgh Harbour by Murray East, which I announced uh, during a visit there last month. The oil and gas expertise, uh, I'm conscious of the time, presiding officer, gained through over 40 years experience of operating in the North Sea is helping us to overcome the engineering and innovation challenges faced in offshore wind and areas like corrosion and, and uh, maintenance activities and providing the skills necessary to transition to the renewable sector. I'll come back to Claudia Beamish on the issue of the TTF given time constraints, but we'll continue to work closely with our enterprise agencies and other partners to maximise the economic benefit to the Scottish supply chain from renewable energy development in Scotland and uh, the announcement of regular CFD auctions by Claire Perry in July, something we had pushed for very much welcome because it provides uh, much needed visibility that gives supply chain companies the opportunity, the confidence to make strategic investments and meaningful collaborations required to compete both within the UK and internationally, as David Torrance has said. So, presiding officer, there's been a valuable debate. I know members on all sides are focused on ensuring that in Scotland we maximise the economic opportunity arising from future deployment of offshore wind. I hope uh, members are assured that we are already taking steps necessary to prepare the, for the future of offshore wind through the scoping work done for the sectoral marine plan, our actions to drive forward innovation in the sector and our continued support for the Scottish supply chain. Uh, the future energy transition will bring many opportunities to rising officer, but I hope we can all agree that Scotland should remain at the forefront in renewable energy, including offshore wind. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the debate. Now close this meeting.